Good afternoon and welcome. If everyone can hear me, welcome to our final instalment of the Investment for New South Wales Going Global webinar series to help climate tech startups launch and scale overseas. And today's webinar is focused on the Europe and UK. My name is Charlotte Connell. I'm a Climate Tech Ecosystems Director here at Climate Salad, and we're also joined by our Programs Director, Olivia, and of course, our Founder and CEO, Mick Levinskis. I, before I introduce our panellists and uh, Lacia from Investment New South Wales, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land of which we meet, which for me, that's the Gubby Gubby people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Uh, Lacia, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Charlotte, and hello all. Today I'm dialing in from Camarigal land. I'd like to pay respect to the Camarigal people, as well as the traditional owners of all the lands from which our participants are dialing in today and their elders past and present. Investment New South Wales is pleased to be partnering with Climate Salad on this webinar series for smart cities and climate tech scale-ups interested in expanding into international markets. Investment New South Wales is the New South Wales government's trade and investment attraction agency. We market Sydney and New South Wales on the world stage with 55 trade and investment specialists in 21 locations around the world. One of our focuses is to support high growth New South Wales businesses to achieve commercial success in international markets by providing trade advisory services and programs like this webinar series. This is the final webinar in our series, as Charlotte mentioned, and today we're looking at the UK and Europe. The Glasgow Breakthrough Agenda launched at COP26 highlights the role of climate technology in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. It sets out goals to make clean technologies affordable and accessible across emitting sectors such as power, road transport, steel, and hydrogen. According to DealRoom, climate tech is the fastest growing vertical for investment in Europe. European climate tech investment has grown seven times since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed. It's currently the second largest vertical for funding just behind fintech. There's currently heavy investment into transportation and energy solutions, enterprise software, circular economy and food companies. Emerging areas of opportunity also include things like carbon removal. As part of the European Commission's 100 climate neutral and smart cities scheme, 112 cities have pledged to achieve climate neutrality by 2030. Solutions to meet such targets are being adopted in multiple cities and markets across Europe. I'm looking forward to hearing from both our speakers today about experiences and opportunities for New South Wales companies in UK and Europe. Lockie recently spent some time hot desking in Investment New South Wales office in London and joined us on a trade mission during which he engaged with financial services players on carbon footprint measurement. Andrew has long been a trusted advisor to Australian companies scaling into the UK and other global markets in both his roles at the UK Department for International Trade and Harbour City Labs. Throughout today's session, there will be surveying and polling, and we hope to better understand the needs of your business so that we can tailor future content and services to you. So please do take part in that polling. Uh, so looking forward to today's session and over to you, Mick, to launch into the session. Thanks so much. Look, really so good to have your support of the mission of both the climate and going global. Both those things are very, very dear to my heart um, and really excited to uh, hear from the two speakers today. It is absolutely right that you know a lot of my work has actually been taking in tech companies to the US, but Europe has been more advanced in terms of uh, cl recognizing climate problems, working on taxonomies, working on uh, policy um, significantly stronger. I, I won't say that has been without challenges, definitely with things like Brexit and others, but um, and and Europe has challenges in terms of multiple countries and, and cultures and, and languages. Um, some say America has multiple cultures and states and languages. Well, let's, let's not go there right now. But um, so um, definitely two really different perspectives we have on the call table in terms of the speakers. Uh, Lockie in the hot seat running um, 
a company and and doing that global growth and Andrew, who I've worked with many times over the last ten years, um, and has been my absolute go-to person of, of market entry for Europe. So, um, and I'm slowly but surely. Um, angling him towards being an absolute climate person, um, which he's going to dedicate that uh, at the end of this uh, webinar. He's just going to pledge his next 10 years to climate. So um, totally up to you, Andrew, completely your choice. So well, I'm, I'm really done with fintech, so. <laughs> exactly. I mean, what part of fintech isn't climate tech anyway or should be? So, um, look, and I, I think the thing is here, we've got, um, we've got a lot of entrepreneurs. There's probably another 40 or 50 who are, unable to make this call today who absolutely through our intro report very focused on Europe um, so we want to make sure we can we're recording this and sharing or we'll share this back to back to everybody here um, and we just want to hear, hear the realities of different stages how do we how do we enter the US the European market how do we what's the first step how do we grow teams there how do we think about it in terms of a single market and not um, so um, I would love to, Andrew, since you, you're um, unmuted, I'm going to take that as a sign to uh, pass it over to, to you, but um, would love to hear just your background in general themes and support and also, um, uh, you know, in terms of um, hints and tips about where we should get started. Yeah, thanks, Mick. Um, so, uh, as Mick said, um, I run Harvest City Labs uh, here in Sydney. So, uh, it's essentially a co-working space for scale-ups in Barangaroo, and uh, my job is head of growth. But for the past 16 years, I've had quite a similar role with the UK government. So, I advise the UK government uh, on entrepreneurship, which essentially looks like finding entrepreneurs across Australia and New Zealand who are looking to enter the UK and then to do what an entrepreneur would normally do to help another entrepreneur. So uh, given the benefit of experience, uh, networks, contacts, um, and the way our program is set up is there are 25 of us around the world uh, and we're remunerated by the UK government. So there's no charge to companies. And it's really just what do these guys need to get across to the UK? So uh, the process really is sit down, have a chat, talk about your strategy, ask some questions, uh, and then you know, have some sort of robust discussions around um, what it is you're trying to do. Um, one of the great advantages of the program and, and, and having done it for 16 years is pattern recognition. So one of the things I'd say to almost every entrepreneur is there are a bunch of mistakes um, that you will make, but you don't need to make. And there are heaps of people, um, whether it's Lassia, whether it's Mick, uh, whether it's Lockie, who have done stuff and you can learn from them and you can avoid the really obvious mistakes and go and invent some new mistakes for our benefit rather than kind of fall into those old holes that have been there for ages. Uh, it, it's that classic thing of you don't know what you don't know. Um, I think what you say about Europe being, um, you know, like the US, multiple languages, multiple cultures, it, it really is true. Um, and, and with that, of course, comes multiple jurisdictions. Uh, and, you know, as you say a lot, Mick, it's, it's quite tricky to go into a number of territories all at once. Um, really, the best thing is to go into a single territory. And the great thing about Europe is that you can base yourself somewhere. Now, I'm totally biased. I'm going to say the UK is the best place to base yourself. I can back that up, though. Um, so if, if you base yourself in the UK, you can then be accessing the whole European market. Uh, it's not that you have to have uh, entities or people in each of those markets as well. And there are traps in doing that. So I'd say um, treat Europe as a single market, yes, have a single base, uh, and then maybe have a hub and spoke kind of um, pattern for going out to that market. Fantastic. Um, it's so um, interesting to hear your, your wealth of experience, Andrew. And if, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, use the chat function or just unmute yourself and ask away. We might pass over to Lockie now. Um, Lockie, can you share your experiences, please? Yeah, no worries at all. And um, firstly, thanks everybody for having me. It, it does feel a little bit funny to be telling people about, you know, my do's and don'ts about launching to, to the UK because uh, it was only five months ago now that I was speaking to Andrew in a call, um, you know, from, from my place in Sydney and saying, look, I'm a little bit nervous about this move. I think we, we might be going a little bit too early. Um, and Andrew's advice, and, and, you know, as everyone would share here, right, our, our reason and rationale for going quite early as a, as a startup was 
Australia, especially at the time, was moving slowly in the sustainability space. We were uncertain about what was happening from a government and regulation perspective. And we knew that if we're serious about being, you know, a global recognized market leading sustainability tech startup that we needed to be with the markets that were pushing the pace and those those markets without a doubt are the uk and the eu and i was speaking about this with andrew and he said look most of the startups i speak to have the same concern and then i speak to them when he does his check-in later on um and like we speak regularly and their their point is i wish we went earlier so that was very reassuring and um yeah off off i went i think my learnings from the experience and and sorry to give you a bit of context so net nada is a software uh, that automates the analysis of business carbon emissions and then suggests the best ways for those organizations to reduce their emissions while also uh, increasing their return on investment and stakeholder engagement so obviously we work off conversion factors um, and under, understanding where emissions are generated uh, within different economies and different countries. So for us, we had to do a little bit of work in adjusting part of our products, uh, especially on the back end side of things, to make sure that our system still worked in the UK. Um, what we all know is that the UK and the EU are, you know, pushing the climate space a, a lot faster. Now, what that means is I think here in Australia, we're probably all guilty of trying to be everyone's friend a little bit um, because our climate space isn't as big and it's not as mature. My, and as a result, especially NetNada, what we do is, you know, we work with so many different companies in, I would probably say 15, 20 different industries. We got over there with the same approach. And I think my tip would be, don't take your Australian approach. Um, try and figure out what your UK approach or your Europe approach will be before you get there. And I know that sounds like simple advice and, and, you know, everybody, you know, have you done your market research? Yes, of course I've done my market research. You, you know, all the stats about your space. Um, you, can, you can say them while you sleep. Um, but I think it really would have helped us if we'd gotten over there and said, we're targeting financial services, the financial services industry, because the banks are putting pressure on them that they need a report as part of the scope three of the lending organizations and as such this is our sort of target hit list but we instead got over there and, and we're like you know we we've we've had a conversation with the company like this so we're going to try and get into into this door and you know we're going to um leverage you know a bit of word of mouth here and there um so that would that'd be my first point the second point would be try and have something lined up so that you can get a free case study at worst case scenario going straight away. Because we have all these amazing statistics about how we've helped businesses in Australia and our aggregated benefits and the cost savings and the emissions reductions and all of these sorts of things. Um, the British are certainly not as bad as the Americans in, in thinking that we live on an alien planet down here. Um, however, fair enough, they want to see UK case studies. Um, and it doesn't really count to tell them how many dollars you've saved somebody or how much emissions you've saved down here in Australia. Um, they want to know what's happened in the UK. So that'd be my sort of my first two tips. Can I point out, like, Lockie, what you did was, was like textbook what we try and get a lot of entrepreneurs to do. So it's really hard to figure out, is the UK the market for me? From this far away and when we talked you're about to hop on a plane and head over there and you weren't quite sure and we had that discussion around just go and talk to people go and seek advice don't ask them for their business don't ask for investment um, and as you did that you kind of figured out the product market fit wasn't quite right what you needed to change which market you needed to attack and actually you got some really strong market sense from that trip um, and that's perfect that's what i'd say to everyone just just um, you can do a certain amount from here nothing beats getting on a plane now it's post COVID or in the midst of COVID um, nothing beats just getting on a plane and going and talking to those people. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, Andrew, uh, the, the plane travel advice and the climate group, maybe, uh, maybe might not fall with, with everybody. No, but um, I, I do. Agree, you know, there, there is a, a tremendous amount of value in that. And look, what we've done just so everybody understands the space we're at. And I think this is, you know, as, fellow entrepreneurs in this group as some good advice I got given once from an investor was um, don't ask, you know, Mike Cannon Brooks for advice on how to run your startup for the next 
12, 18 months because he's probably forgotten how to do it, right? You want to be asking that that startup who's just kind of done it. So I think hopefully my advice is, is, is relevant here. Um, we, we went over, we've got six clients now in the UK, um, ranging in contract value. Um, I've come back, obviously I'm, I'm in Sydney now. Um, we have somebody in the UK, she's working, um, you know, semi part-time for us. And then we're delivering on the contracts we have and then hopefully build some great case studies off the back of those. And then at the end of the year, once everyone in, I'm sure if anyone here has Instagram or anything like that, we're seeing they're all enjoying themselves on beaches in the South of France. So once they're all done with their summer holiday, um, work starts again and hopefully, you know, net nada hits the ground really hard um, with these, these built up case studies and, um, and the momentum we've carried across. So that's where we're at. We're not, you know, we're not sitting next to Facebook in, in Europe, um, but we're, that's, that's the sort of space we're at. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Andrew, you mentioned um, that in the UK at the moment, there's now on average, they're creating about one, one um, unicorn every 11 days. Can you speak to that growth and potential in the UK? Yeah, so um, investment in the UK last year was 35 billion euros. Um, the, the next nearest was Germany at 17. Um, and there are 41 unicorns so far out of the UK and um, 25 across um, Germany. So they're, they're kind of the, the two big economies. Um, one of the big changes, so historically, if you go back um, 15 or 16 years, they, they kind of started to notice um, that a whole bunch of startups had, had gathered around something called, well, they, they named it Silicon Roundabout uh, in Old Street in London. And it was just kind of this sort of warehouse area. You know, um, there are parts on, of Sydney that are, that are quite similar. And someone from number 10 actually got interested and started asking what's going on here and, and how can we help? Out of that came a range of initiatives which have really catapulted the, the startup sector in the UK. And probably the most significant one is something called the Enterprise Investment Scheme. Um, what this means is that uh, someone investing in a startup in the UK, um, they can get 30% of their investment back on tax. So let's say it again. If I invest 100 bucks into a startup in the UK, I can claim 30 bucks back off my tax. Now, if I double my money, um, my gains are tax free. If I lose, I can claim back the rest of my losses and I can pass on my shares, my dividends, whatever, in my estate with no tax. So what that means is you, you have a whole bunch of um, smart, usually um, successful entrepreneurs with pocketfuls of cash looking to recycle that cash into the next big thing. And there's a, a stack of them, people like Brent Hoberman, um, the guys who, who started um, TransferWise, um, they're all now major investors. And, and uh, so what it did was it stimulated a huge investment in the UK. Uh, I always say, you know, in Australia, you'd be mad not to just put your money into another flat somewhere in Parramatta, right? You know, it's, it's going to double every five years given. Um, what they did in the UK was to kind of even the, the, the playing field. So to invest in a startup actually became um, something you consider as part of your portfolio. So we also have the people who are investing now, they're successful entrepreneurs. So they're, they're actually now able to help the next generation of entrepreneurs. So it's not just their money, it's who they are and why they're investing. And um, we've just seen a snowballing. Uh, there was also a scheme for a while, which um, they don't run anymore. And that was rewarding entrepreneurs who are successful. So um, of your first 10 million pounds that you made as an entrepreneur from selling your company, uh, you only paid 10% tax. So the levers that are pulling in the UK, one to help investors get in and help entrepreneurs, the other to reward entrepreneurs who are successful by leaving more cash in their pockets. So they would then become investors as well. So we've seen, uh, we've seen uh, government um, get involved, but get involved in a really clever way, uh, be highly supportive. And I would argue even schemes, so, so the program I work in as part of the UK's Department of International Trade is called the Global Entrepreneur Program. So you know, what government gets 25 mad entrepreneurs around the world to go hunting for other entrepreneurs and help them? Uh, you know, it's, it's unheard of. So these are the sort of initiatives that the UK has put in place and continues to support. And it's, um, you know, the UK is now saying we want to be a technology powerhouse. Um, that comes out of the mouth of the Prime Minister 
and the cabinet. So um, there's this focus backed by really clever initiatives and over a period of time, it's snowballed and snowballed. So the UK VC is now very strong. Every major US VC is based in the UK as well. They do lots of co-investment. And it's that really nice thing, whereas a few years ago, we might've said, you know, do you think about the UK or the US? Well, clearly you must do both. Just figure out what order you do them in. And there's lots of UK VCs helping UK companies into the US and lots of US companies actually going into the UK and meeting UK VCs there as well. Andrew, you're making my job very easy. That was going to be my next point. So, sorry, mate. No, sorry, it's fantastic. Mate. That scheme is crazy. You won't see anything like that from in, from an angel investment perspective. So, yeah. Yep. Uh, it sounds incredible. In, sorry to interrupt. Someone told me to jump in. Um, Benjamin here from Vertus Energy. Um, we're currently expanding into Europe, and we're just doing the analysis of where we need to set up. Um, there's a lot of EU funding. Uh, Repower EU and Horizon Europe that are going to be perfect for our company. We're playing around with the idea of how we access the EU um, grants, which obviously I'm from the UK, so I know how the UK have been flirting with Europe for a little while and are leaving, leaving the EU now. So how that kind of how they can access that funding. But I understand that there's a lot of funding available um, through the EIS in, in the UK. How do we access both of that and still attract US investors to try and keep the valuations high? Um, so, so the first thing I say on grants is, you know, there are there are obviously grants and incentives across the UK as well. And and um, with Brexit, um, they did a lot of mirroring of, of uh, the existing EU grants. The second thing I'd say is something that Nikki Shabak said to me years ago, which is that, you know, um, Grants and incentives from government are the icing, they're not the cake. Focus on the cake. If there's icing when you get there, great. Um, but the cake is the market uh, and the people who are there to support you and, and help you get revenue. Uh, the, the, way to, the way to access EIS, you need to have a permanent establishment in the UK. So you can be an Australian headquartered company, not a problem, but you need to have a permanent establishment in the UK. Uh, they need to talk to your accountant, get EIS approved, which is just an administrative task. There's a few little rules around their investors have to keep their shares for three years. You can't have more than 150 employees. Um, the, the sorts of rules that are fairly simple to keep, but you just need to be aware of those. And then once you've got that assurance from your accountant and um, the UK government, you can go out and tell investors that you are, you are EIS eligible. So they will get um, tax back on their investments. Okay, and how long does that process usually take to get set up? Um, to become EIS compliant and receive mm -hmm. your approval, it's about three months minimum. Okay. It's just it's okay. just administrative. You can actually, with an account, just let it go out a lot earlier. Uh, yeah. And investors can just hold back their final investment until they get the, the final seal of approval. But it's black and white. It's not, it's not that someone has to judge it. It's just if you mm -hmm. tick the boxes, it's a given. Okay, perfect. No, that's really helpful. I mean, the market for us is in Europe to start with, and then we'll expand into into the US. Um, but yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, and and so you know, you want to be telling the VCs uh, in the UK that, and you want to be starting to talk to the um, the UK offices of the US VCs uh, mm -hmm. who are all represented in London. You know, they get that story now. It, it, it makes sense to them, and they want to see. Often, they want to see these investments before they get across to the US. They want to see them earlier. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Just, Appreciate just it. Jumping in onto uh, your point there, Ben, as well. Um, this is something I didn't know until I got over there. Um, the there's a lot of incentives as well to set up outside of London. So if you are UK focused, just also consider, um, yeah, setting up elsewhere. There's a lot of good talent <clears throat> outside of London. You also typically have to pay them twenty. A lot less. <laughs> or so percent less um, yeah. and there's also a lot of incentives. So the, I won't say Shire, I'll say Shear, uh, like Cambridge Shear and, and, and different areas, like they'll set up industry focused incentives. Um, they also have their own uh, like business associate groups, which you can mm -hmm. present to and all these sorts of things. So definitely worth considering. Um, there's a lot of talent in Bristol. That was, Alasio was sort of, over there with me and I didn't actually get to the Bristol trip, but Lazio, did you go to, no? Uh, 
yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of talent outside of London. So I think I didn't think of that when I went there, but it's definitely worth looking at. And there's a lot of incentives to set up outside of London as well. There's a lot of ecosystems outside of London as well. So if you take Newcastle, which like our Newcastle is sort of northeast and um, dominated by coal, uh, the UK is Newcastle pretty similar. So it's it's oil and gas, um, but obviously it's it's um, now um, transitioning to renewables. So it's one of the biggest areas for um, renewable energy research. The universities are there, uh, the, the major corporations who are trying to, to get out of uh, oil and gas. So when you look at the map of the UK, you actually might find that there are a particular specialties that would appeal to your company, which means there are ecosystems, researchers, talent, um, experts, incentives, um, and it goes on and on. So, so look at the whole map, it's not just London. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, really appreciate that. Thank you. We've got a question from Pavina, and she asks, what's the benefit of setting up in the UK versus a market in the EU to service EU clients and access EU recovery funds? Yeah, um, I've got a whole presentation on this, if, you, if, you, if anyone wants to hear it. Um, so um, Europe can be complex and the regulation um, can trip you up. So it's, it's not a, I'm, I'm not saying don't, um, you just need to be aware of the differences. So for instance, um, in the UK, you'll pay about 15% social security tax. So when you employ someone, you'll pay an extra 15% of their salary into social security. In France, it's 45%. Um, the UK has one of the lowest taxes for social security across Europe. Generally, I think uh, Germany is sort of 20%, um, the Netherlands about 20%, 30% for Spain. So it's quite high tax. And then there's, there's a whole bunch of regulations you need to be aware of. Um, so if you want to dismiss someone from your business um, in the UK, they have to have been with your business for two years before they can claim unfair dismissal. So in other words, if in the first two years of them working, you need to get rid of them, um, you can do that. You just fire them. If you do that in France, the minimum they'll get, so they'll they'll trigger unfair dismissal straight away, and the minimum you'll pay them is six months' salary, if if you lose the unfair dismissal case. Um, so uh, UK, they've got to be your company for two years to get those benefits. Ireland, it's one year, and in the rest of Europe, it's about zero years. So they get it straight away. Um, so all I'm saying is, is consider if you know as soon as you have a salesperson who can sign contracts in any country, that's generally considered a permanent establishment. You're now subject to the regulation, tax, employment law of that country. So you need to get across that and understand it. And, and that's, um, I would suggest, probably not something you want to do on day one of um, going global. Um, you know, it, complicated equals expensive. Thank you. Thanks for um, giving that overview. That's really helpful. Um, would love to get access to that full presentation you, would, you were referring to. Would you mind leaving your contact details in the chat box? I'll, I'll, um, I'll chat to Lassie here and, and she can figure out a way of, of um, getting you. that out. But by all means, you know, so as I say, um, we're all pushing in the same direction. So anything that we can do to help you with information, really happy to. Fun fact, if you rent somewhere in Germany, um, it, it will come with no kitchen, no light fittings, no taps. Um, when you rent in Germany, you, you buy your own kitchen and put that in as well. Just little things you've got to be aware of when you're thinking about going to Europe. Uh, and there are some odd things about the UK as well, which I can tell you. Yeah, the no kitchen in Germany thing seems like a bit of a, a bump in the road. <laughs> Um, we might throw to Lockie now. Um, what is your cautionary advice? What is something that startups looking to expand to the UK should not do? Um, yeah, for sure. So my main one would be know what your plan is for your Australian company when you go over there um, and your Australian or your Australian organisation, your operation, know how you're going to look after all of your operations here in, in Oz. Now, obviously, like with major clients and things like that, that's that's easy. Um, but I'm very much of the of the mentality, which I'm sure a lot of other startup founders are, of you know, bring on the work, let's do it. I'll get I'll get up at two a.m. in the morning. That's fine, no worries. I'll, I'll do the calls. I'll stay up until midnight, and let's do it all over again, right? Um, which does work. You can do that, and and 
you can do it for a certain amount of time. Um, but it's just about having like the processes in place to make sure that your staff culture is staying the way you, you'd like it to, to make sure that your communication channels with your business partners is the same, just to make sure that all of the right check-ins are there. Um, because yeah, it was a sort of a challenge that, that, um, uh, that I'm now reflecting back on, think I could have done a better job with. So that would be my main thing. And you can see it in our, like, for example, you can see it in our revenue for the months that I was gone, right? Like you can see the, the, sh the shift and then you can see the, the jump, huge jump up when I've come back. And it's not because I'm good at my job or anything. It's more just because of the, who knew they were doing what role and, and how the whole, the whole, whole beast of things was operating. So that'd be my main point. Andrew, what about you? Any uh, cautionary advice? Yeah, and it's similar to, to um, what Lockie's just been saying. And Lockie and I have had some robust discussions on that as well. Um, uh, we often look at, um, there's this great opportunity over, over in this other country, whether it's the US or the UK or Europe. We see this great opportunity, we wanna go and grab this great opportunity, um, but we forget we need to look at the risks as well. And so I liken it to, you know, if you're ever, um, I, I used to work in TV and when you get in the chopper, there's, there's four of you, but all four of you are co-pilots, whether you realize it or not, you've all got a job to do. And that job is because you're flying in unrestricted space, you need to be looking out for the other choppers and the other planes so you don't hit them. And it, it means you're constantly talking. I can see a chopper over there, have you got it? And you're looking for the risks because if you can identify those risks a long way out, you can avoid them. If you only see that risk at the last minute, you're dead. So my advice is don't just consider the, the massive reward overseas. You've got to consider what are the risks of attacking that for my business? You know, Lockie just kind of pointed out slight dip in the last few months. So, you know, that was a risk. Uh, did, did they know that, that risk was coming their way? So it's easy to look at the reward. Let's go for that big contract. But we forget there's a risk. And the risk might be that we are ripping the guts out of our home business and it's not sustainable. Um, uh, the risk might be that we start to lose culture because you've got these kind of two offices and, and neither is, is particularly well resourced. The risk is that we land a big fish and we really just can't slice it up effectively. And so we annoy a large customer and we actually haven't um, created a success for that customer. So I'd, I'd say look at risk and consider those. The other thing I'd say is um, when you're thinking about going overseas, do it as early as possible and um, do it with a blank sheet of paper. So my frustration is I'm usually talking to entrepreneurs who have started something in Australia, um, kind of built it up to a certain level, and then they start thinking about going overseas. And it's kind of like a bolt-on to their strategy, whereas it should actually be core to their strategy. Going overseas, when and how, that's core to who we are. It's not a bolt-on because things have happened to go better than we thought, or we've magically got these customers pulling us in this direction. Um, yeah, that's the other thing. Are you being pulled overseas? Are you being pushed? Is it, is it the lack of Australian market that's pushing you or is it the, the great option you overseas? But on the strategy, I say, look, um, and Lockie, I think we did this as well. Uh, you know, if, if, we, if, we look at your, if we look at your revenue in five years' time and you're in Australia and you're in one other country, call it the UK for argument's sake, I often say in five years' time, if you resource both offices um, satisfactorily, what's your global revenue? And they usually say, the entrepreneurs I talk to, it's going to be 80% of my revenue will be coming from the UK and 20% from Australia. So then the next question is, okay, if you're going to start a company today that has 80% of its revenue coming from the UK in five years' time and 20% from Australia, how would you organise that company? Where would you be hiring staff? what customers would you be talking to? What investors would you be talking to? It's not to say there's a set answer to those things, but it's to say, if that's your intent, it's not just kind of bolt on, it's actually massively important. It's the thing that's gonna make or break your company. It's this huge opportunity. So have a strategy that recognizes that and, and gets you to that point as quickly as possible and as aggressively as possible. So you get as much success as possible. Totally agree. And, and just jumping onto that point as well, um, my other sort of tip would be know what moves the, moves the needle, so to speak, in, in that market. Um, 
and it's so much more than just knowing your competitors, right? It's knowing like the network of businesses that work together and the, the, essentially know the climate salad that exists in, in the UK. Like try, try and really understand things outside of your direct, um, what you might see as your direct market analysis. Um, and also try that the more, the more little things you know before you get over there, the better. For example, I didn't know before we got over there that it was mandated for businesses uh, who are submitting on government tenders over $5 million to have sustainability reports, right? Um, but I did know that you know, every business in the financial services space has to do it, every business in the top 1,500 companies, their supply chain, so on and so forth. There's a lot that I knew, but then there was just little unique things that I didn't know. And, and the other thing is like getting to how, understand- how did, you, how did you discover those things? How did you learn them? Conversations, like, conversations, right? Um, so right there is, is exactly what you did brilliantly, right? So, so when an entrepreneur goes overseas, don't think of it as going to get customers and going to get investors. Think of it as building the, the best network of anyone in the world. So you need to have the absolute best network and just go and talk to people. And it's out of that that you get the insights Lockie's talking about. You also get customers, you also get investors. I would just say just, just network like crazy because no one in the world should be as networked in your sphere as you yourself. Yeah. I event Eventbrite is a big help, guys. Um, it's not great for your social life. You probably won't see as many musicals as you, you plan to, but um, yeah, pretty much every night I'd, I would spend at a networking event. And it, it is to the point where I would go to um, like university pitch nights where they were doing pitch, like entrepreneurship pitches. And this was not even like, this wasn't even like their flagship program where they're celebrating the end of the year. This would be literally their, a, a course that's done it for a semester in entrepreneurship. But you go, there's 100 people there. You speak to 100 people. Maybe one person's useful. Fantastic. Um, so, yeah, you get on Eventbrite, find every event that's going and just register for all of them. Expect that you'll have to pay for a few of them, but, but a few of them are free and off you go. And don't forget to ask if you, know, if you get that one good person out of 100, ask them to introduce you to one or two other people. So you, every time you, you're networking. And do that forever. Don't just do it, you know, when you get there, do it every week yeah and i see julie oh sorry yeah, yeah sorry yeah lucky do you have um a group like climate salad in the uk or us that you think we could hit up because i'm very strong towards word of mouth and character to deliver aspirations that need real collaboration rather than just a territory grab yeah um so firstly no one's like climate salad so <laughs> I've uh, just joined and I'm very impressed. No, thanks for laying me up on that one. Um, no, but uh, to be honest, no, um, because we tried to go about the whole like Slack channel route, you know, throw us in there. We, we got introed by one of our clients into a Slack channel. It's for CFOs in the UK. There's I think a couple thousand CFOs that are all in this group and they have a group and things like that. But you, you just need to, you need to see people. If you're going to fly halfway across the world, you really need to see people. So I, um, we didn't have, we, we put like a job ad in there with a, with a voucher, I think it was an Amazon voucher or something that said, if you fill out this survey as a, as an Amazon C, as a, one of the CFOs, and you also get a free subscription with us or something, or something along those lines, we didn't get any responses. So I just think it, maybe our offering wasn't right, but I, it's just, we got so much more and you get so much traction in this space if people just have the 30 seconds to hear your elevator pitch. But I feel like they are very saturated with like, hey, there's a new startup. Hey, there's these guys are coming up. They don't really care. I think you need to get in front of them and, um, and meet them. Well, that's something I my bizarre curveball question, right? Which is... Um, you know, did I even really want to pitch to some angels? Not really. That's not my style and not my forte. Um, my my first steps of this last month has been word of mouth only on yeah. a deep relationship with individuals and then only from deep reflection they have also provided filtering before making a referral and then it's been a, a deep dive into character and nature there. Um uh, so, I mean, what my question was then back to the start of um, business strategy, 
Do you recommend we start administrative offices then based in, like, say, the UK? Well, I've got, like, a hubby um, family in the UK, right? So that's, I mean, do you set up, like, an admin office to then leverage that story for when you're ready to hit the ground running with the right commercial partners? Okay. I, I've got a few thoughts on this. Um, firstly, so firstly, rewinding a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was 15 minutes late, so I missed the main presentation. No, 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 you're, you're right. I would say, knowing your, your skill set and all the rest very briefly, tell your Australian customers and partners that you're going, right? Because they may have a network. If, you, if they're already word of mouthing you here, they'll word of mouth you over there, mm. right? That happened for us. We got word of mouth. One of the CEOs of the companies we work with, he's a British guy, seems quite connected over there bang straight away as, as i got off a plane i went to a meeting right um so that that's my first point um secondly on that is i wouldn't advise you to set up and, and andrew's way better for this than me but my opinion is i wouldn't advise you to set up in your cousin's house just yet because as i was alluding to before there may be better benefits for you if you set up somewhere else you mean in the UK versus... Um, no, I mean in, like, if your cousin lives in London, it may no, be... No, no, my husband. My husband's your husband. don't, family's don't, in the UK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, whoever yeah. it is, his family. But my point is, don't just go and do it without getting advice on it first. Because okay. it might be beneficial for you to not set up in the suburb that they live in. Administratively? Yes. I mean, okay, all right. Yep, because of all your grants and... Yeah, I was wishing there was like some sort of cheat sheet summary for the UK, EU and US, that's all. Um. <laughs> no, uh, not quite, yeah, so unfortunately not. <laughs> the one thing we do have is a checklist that our trade commissioner based in London has developed. So I think um, we can share that with the climate solid team to send around and that's set up operations checklist that leads you to timelines through different uh, aspects of setting up in the UK. So you might find that handy. There are also some other really great guides that UK associations and organizations have put together around the time of UK FinTech Week. This company, Smith & Williamson, had launched a report that really dived quite deep into setting up in the UK. Now it was focused on fintechs, but a lot of the learnings are translatable across different tech sectors. So I'd actually highly recommend taking a look at that report as well. So I'll send that through to Charlotte to distribute. The other thing I would note is that Investment New South Wales, we're the state government agency here to help New South Wales businesses. What we can do is plug you into the activities that we are engaging in, in the UK market and in other markets in Europe. We'll, you know, soon we have someone now in Paris, we'll soon have someone in Germany as well. I believe they'll be based in Frankfurt. So, you know, please do engage with us, especially in the lead up to any in-market visits. Let us know weeks in advance, ideally, so that we can see how we can help you and we can you know plug you into the right activities events give you the right connections to service providers potentially even commercial connections if we have suitable connections for you yeah can i just jumping off the back of lazia's point there um wherever you're from if you're in new south wales or victoria or whatever else but i'm from new south wales they were invest in new south wales was incredibly helpful for us um like i couldn't thank them enough they they did so much for us um even to the point of just like having somebody to talk to when you're going oh oh dear it's cold and what have i done no but um it, it they they were fantastic um i i worked actually a lot like closely with them um from their office there in australia house um where investment new south wales is set up Lazio, am i all right am i allowed to say that i feel like yeah they set up a hot desking sort of space for companies to yep um mama suka she's a fantastic person and she's very very hospitable um so yeah i would say reach out to your state um your state government if you're from new south wales i can say you're very lucky
Thanks, Loki. And I did see a question. Will New South Wales help Auckland companies? Look, it, I think it's probably based on uh, what kind of presence you have in New South Wales. Let's say you have a significant office presence in New South Wales. Through undertaking expansion into international markets, you're likely to be adding supporting headcount in New South Wales. I think we could make a business case for helping a company from Auckland, but um, it, it was very case dependent. So uh, do feel free to reach out to me if you think that, you know, you're, you're, uh, you have quite a significant presence in New South Wales. Andrew, you spoke earlier um, about the majority of climate tech companies wanting that 80-20 split between Australia and the UK. Do you think that it's worth early stage companies just going for that UK market before they establish more broadly in Australia? Um, so, so the 80-20 is, um, is any tech company uh, just because of the, so the size, the something about the UK market, it's not just its size, it's just Australian companies find it easier to get successful sales in the UK. Um, there, there's a danger period, um, I think, and, and um, Mick talks about this a lot, and I've learned a lot from listening to Mick's talks on this, but, you know, the Australian company that kind of hangs around in Australia too long. So, you know, we recognise that, that tech companies these days are born global. Um, uh, and, you know, even investment in South Wales' program is going global, right? So if you're going to go global, the question is how much do you need to, um, to be real way in Australia? Um, and then I come back to well, what's, what's the aim of the entrepreneur? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to have a lifestyle business, um, make a little bit of money, or are you trying to be as big as possible, make a massive impact or make billions of dollars? And it doesn't matter what you choose uh, as your aim, but usually it's either I want to make a huge impact or I want to make a lot of money or it's kind of both. Let's say I want to make a huge impact. Then my question becomes, well, do you make a huge impact by kind of doing a bit in Sydney and a bit in Melbourne and then a bit in Brisbane and then, maybe, you know, Perth and Darwin and Adelaide? Or do you... Um, do you make a big impact by kind of figuring out what it is you're doing and then taking that to a big market where is the big opportunity so it can get big and you get stronger and more resourced? That's not to say you abandon what you've got in Australia because that will still serve a really important function. So the question comes down to if you've got this massive market, um, what we tend to do in Australia is wait too long. I'm not sure what we're waiting for. It's kind of like a swimmer who's, you know, wants to win the local race and then the, the city race and then the state race and then maybe go to another state and win some races there and then win the Australian championships before thinking about the Olympics. Whereas if they're any good, you know, you just say, look, let's just try out for the Olympics now. You might not make it, but you'll learn a lot and you'll get stronger and you'll get to the Olympics a lot faster this way. So, you know, we push people as much as possible. If you're, if you're half good, let's push you uh, and let, let's try and make you as excellent as possible. But um, you know, Mick talks about Australia kind of being a confusingly big, large company, country. So you know, it looks large, but the market's tiny. It's a tiny market. Your job as an entrepreneur is to get your start into your next biggest market as quickly as possible and to grow it as quickly as possible. So the question then is not um, when do I leave Australia, but why haven't I left Australia to go and do that? So, you know, Lockie's done that. Still has his team back here doing stuff. Um, but the sooner you get into that market, the sooner you'll become stronger, the sooner you get more resources. But here's the other thing, and I think Lockie's discovered this as well. The gravity of doing business in Australia for a startup is, is so heavy that when you go to a place like the UK, you suddenly realise it's like an astronaut going to the moon. You've, you've been working in such tight gravity that when you get to the UK, you're a super person. Like you're, you're six times stronger. We see a lot of Aussies land in the UK and then just take off massively um, because they've been trained in, in Australia, which is a really hard market for a lot of reasons. So it's good training here, but the sooner you get to that market, the sooner you'll get that massive growth and the sooner you'll achieve the ambitions, which is to make a lot of impact. Can I ask a question? Um, the weird thing is, is I'm pre-revenue and just going to like 
I mean, uh, the emotional buy-in that I've received so far, and then I'm going to have like an opportunity to pitch to owners that are, they sound like to me, like Maverick, Maverick, Maverick Knights of Shining Armour, just already from a converse, two conversations just in the last two weeks, right? Um, but the thing is, is like it will have to be a global collaboration. And it's like, how do you as a, pre-revenue entity one digest and take stock of the amazing validation you get from these mavericks but then also know okay there is a bigger fish but I'll also respectfully and diligently apply myself for this Australian pilot whilst in parallel test the waters to appeal to this other potential market <laughs> potentially like, I mean you know I, I, it's not necessarily green but impact and also understanding or even adjusting to your mindset of being like a inventor to a business person um like I can run money and contracts but um there, there needs to be channels infrastructure employees and stuff like that and I'm very much one person full-time with a whole team that's really skillful not fully full-time and you know I, I need to develop and build the confidence of my team so that they can quit their jobs and join there's all these like nuances in a, a transition to scale up if we are strategically doing the thing that you mentioned which is all right well where is the next best thing then to do it diligently um it, it sounds like you're a product market fit state and so your, your job yeah. is to make sure that your product suits the market your job as an entrepreneur is to show that you can make a sale and get repeat sales. Mm. And then you need to look at what's the next best market for you to be in. So I think you're at that earlier stage. So just focus on the aims of that stage, which is get a good product to market and please your customers and make money and show that you can do it again and again. Yep. Can I just jump in there as well? Like just to make sure it doesn't sound like we're just giving advice. It says, you know, do it, do it, do it. And it's, it's always <laughs> going to work. Like I think, um, yeah. like like advice to, to anybody um, with a business you, you need to really critically evaluate yourself and your team and the skill sets that you do and don't have and identify where and also quantify and, and put value on things like your network in the city that you're from um, because going over there while it sounds fantastic and you get off that plane and you know a handful of people compared to being home knowing potentially thousands it is way more difficult like it is considerably more difficult and if you're not the type of person who is going to as andrew said make themselves the most networked person in that space then you need to really figure out what your strategy is going to be from a marketing and sales perspective and if you're the right person to do it so i, I would say just make sure that like you analyze whether or not you have whether timing is right, that's the main point. It's all about timing. Yeah, that's making a lot more sense now because I was like hearing, ah, duh, and it's like, hang on, let's contextualise this as a, a late comer. So apologies. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. Um, I think, Julie, absolutely would love to line up some one-on-one -on -one sessions with you. The, these workshops, and again, massively appreciative of the of the New South Wales um, government team for supporting us on this um, and for Lockie and Andrew for coming along today. Um, and Olivia and Charlotte, once again, saving my butt while I'm doing too many things at once. But um, uh, the, the, absolutely, I think just to echo something and, Andrew really highlighted was um, this is not a prescriptive, if you don't go global, you're wasting our time. But, but what we definitely have in Australia, much more next to New Zealand, is this mid-sized companies that get stuck in Australia and don't get out at all. Um, I love taking companies overseas um, to see the bigger market, the bigger opportunity, and it works for some and it doesn't work for, for most, actually. Most, a lot of Aussies will come back to Australia and build slowly here, and that's, that's, that's completely fine. Our, our whole purpose of Climate Salad and these workshops is just to increase the opportunity for Australian climate tech entrepreneurs, Australian New Zealand climate tech entrepreneurs, to at least uh, explore and consider global opportunities. And then if you want to go the next step and go over there and have a look, we'll help you with that too. If you want to go get customers set up a team, we'll help you with that as well. But the first step is at least to consider it because first of all, climate solutions don't stop at anyone's border. Um, we need to solve globally. And second of all, it's the biggest success you can make. If you can go global and solve that, you'll, you'll be uh, outsized and that supports a lot of things. So, um, so lots of good follow-up there. It is about finding your own way in your own journey. 
massive thank you again for our New South Wales and last year and the team for for really really supporting these these webinars and I I really hope we're, we're about to tick over into to July one and I'm looking forward to doing a, a, a even more projects with you next year. Um, huge thanks to Olivia and Charlotte for uh, again organising this, structuring it, and running the session, and a, a massive quiet Zoom round of applause or unmute, you know. Um, and thank you for for Lockie and Andrew for um, sharing their experience with us today. So, um, but as I say, the, the important people in all these rooms are the, the people running these companies, and um, so um, uh, Julie, uh, the Fully team, Benjamin, um, Kirsten. Uh, Dave Pavina, thank you for for doing the hard work, sitting doing that very hard work of entrepreneurship, innovation, and climate all at the same time. So thank you. And um, I, I thought I'd just chime in there. Lucky has generously put his contact details in the chat. Um, if you would like to get in touch with Andrew Lassia, please do reach out to us. Um, and of course, it, being part of these webinars was. Um, was okay to provide your contact details to Investment New South Wales so they could follow up with you with all their opportunities and the support that they offer. Thank you so much, Lesia.